Well, good morning, everybody. Let's stand and praise the Lord this morning. Everything that has breath, praise the Lord, because Jesus Christ is risen. Amen. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. I'll praise in the valley, I'll praise on the mountain. Yeah. I'll praise when I'm sure, I'll praise when I'm down. be seated this morning. We want to say happy Easter to you. He is risen. That's right. He is risen indeed. Let's try it again. He is risen. Amen. We're so glad that you're worshiping with us today. If it's been a while since you've been with us or maybe this is your first time, we'd encourage you to stop by the Welcome Center. We have a nice gift we'd like to bless you with. It's a mug with some chocolates. I even sip my coffee this morning in preparation for the sermon today with my new life mug all right they're good ones all right so if you're a visitor just trade your information for a mug okay that's all we're asking you okay just so we can send you lots of emails all right that's it 
Uh, but anyway, we are just glad that you're worshiping with us today. We're so glad. Easter is such a great Sunday, and we are so thankful for the resurrection of our Savior and our Lord Jesus Christ as Christians. And so what I'd like to do this morning is I'd like to begin with a reading from Matthew chapter 28. And if you have your Bibles, you can turn with us there. If not, we will, you can follow along on the screen behind me. Matthew chapter 28 gives the account of the resurrection of our Lord. It says in 28 and verse 1, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Jesus didn't hide it. He had told them all along that he would rise. They just missed it. Come and see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the, his disciples' word. And as they went to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice! So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Praise God for the resurrection of our Savior and our Lord Jesus. Would you join me in prayer this morning? Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord God, we come before you and we thank you for the death, burial, and ultimately the resurrection of Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for what that means for our lives individually and for what that means for all of humanity. Lord, we come before you today and we ask that during this time that you would be glorified and you would be honored through our worship of you and song, through our worship of you, through the teaching and study of your word. And Lord, I pray that in all things, Lord, you would be honored. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning. And welcome to our family service at New Life. You just got a glimpse of what your kids will be learning about in their classroom today. We have a wonderful children's ministry with children from nursery to fifth grade, where they're taught the Word of God, encouraged to memorize scripture, play energetic games, and do so in a loving environment. Our teachers are excited to join you in nurturing a child's spiritual growth. We want you to know that if your little ones become restless during the service, we have a cozy mommy and me room. Your child can play and enjoy a snack while you continue to engage in worship through the monitor. 
Thank you for being here with us. At this time, grades one through five can be dismissed. Please meet your adult leaders at the side entrance. All right, as the children are dismissed, let's stand and continue to sing and celebrate our risen Lord. Shame is a prison, as cruel as a grave. Oh, shame is a robber, and he's coming to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Oh, love is the power, when my freedom song is found. There ain't no grave.
Amen. You may be seated as we go to our time of offering this morning. As you know, there are three ways you can give here at New Life. As you leave the auditorium, there are receptacles out in the lobby if you prefer to give in person. If you like to give online, you can go to our website, which is nlpositivefaith.com. Follow the giving links there, or you can get to the same place with the QR code up there. If you're watching online or you prefer to give via mail, you can. we ask that you mail to New Life Church, P.O. Box 228, Osceola, Indiana, 46561. However you choose to give, we thank you for your generosity as you support our gospel ministries here at New Life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for our offering this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, you are alive. You are, you are all powerful. You are holy. Lord, we, we praise you. We thank you on this incredible morning 
where we can celebrate your resurrection, Lord. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for the resurrection and the power and the gift of salvation that you've given to us, Lord. Lord, as we bring our offering this morning, uh, we, we thank you for the work you have done through our local church here, Lord. We thank you for the lives that are being changed. We thank you for the families that are being strengthened, just all of the work that you are doing through our ministries here, Lord, through your ministry here. Lord, as we bring our offering this morning, we pray that you would continue to use our, our offering, our gifts, our resources, our tithes, Lord, to further your, your kingdom purposes, Lord. We pray that you would continue to change lives for eternity, Lord, continue to work in your powerful ways. We anticipate the goodness that you're going to do today, Lord. I thank you for this morning's service, for Good Friday service, for all the people who are, are feeling real life change, Lord, who are committing themselves to you. And we look forward to the people who are going to make those same decisions t today, Lord. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church this morning? Amen. Amen. Let's give it up for these guys one more time. Awesome. Awesome. Can't imagine what that must have been like to show up and see the empty grave. Can you imagine this? I mean, their Lord and their Savior, who they'd followed for three years, 
who they've been told is the Messiah. He's the coming king. He's the one they've waited for and anticipated and wanted and prayed for. And he finally shows up and he's healing the sick and he's healing the blind. And, you know, he's making miracles here. He's feeding the 5,000, which was really like 25 and 30 and 40,000 people. Like he's just, he's, he's doing incredible things. And then one day <clears throat> he gets ushered to the tree. He gets crucified. He is buried in the ground. You have the disciples who all day on Saturday are, are waiting and just in disarray. You, you know that's how they must have felt in this moment. They've got to be finding themselves wondering what, what has happened. I thought he was the one. I don't get it. What happened? And in true form, the ladies took action. I don't know why it is, but usually women just take action, you know, and the ladies took action, and they were like, well, we need to go follow up with the burial ritual, and so they took the spices, and they headed up to the grave, and they went up to the grave, and they found the stone had been rolled away, and they ran in, and they saw the angels, and they said, don't be afraid, and they looked inside, and he was not there. He was gone, and that had to just completely dumbfound them, but it said, as he said in the scripture, He's not here, he's risen, as he said. And the lights must have all clicked on at the same time, like, oh my goodness, of course he's not here. He told us that he was going to rise. And we just missed it. And they ran, and then they saw Peter and the disciples, and they told them, and <clears throat> Jesus appeared to them and told them he'd meet them in Galilee. I mean, just this moment in the time had to be unbelievable. I was talking with my dad yesterday. I said, Dad, I don't know what it is. I just feel like I'm in the wait. He's preaching in Fort Wayne today as they transition to a new pastor and he's helping that church and we know God's doing an awesome gospel work there and I said I just feel like I'm in the wait and he was like oh yeah the wait is real that's what these people must have been and they must have been in the worst wait possible and then they get there and Jesus has risen from the dead risen from the dead you know we're gathered here today and some of us are like yeah yeah I believe he rose but I mean he was dead his soul had departed from his body, and he rose. That's impossible. The greatest miracle he ever did was rising from the dead. Healing the, the sick was great. Healing the blind was great. Feeding the 5,000 was great. These things were all great. The greatest miracle he ever did was rise from the dead. And we're going to talk about that today. It created a whole new beginning, a whole new start. All of the Old Testament was put behind because they no longer needed the sacrificial system. Oh, the law guides us to Christ, but the sacrificial system was no longer needed because Jesus becomes the eternal sacrifice for us and his resurrection from the dead provides great promises for us and a brand new beginning in so many different ways. We're going to see how faith in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ how it provides a true transformation in every facet of our lives. So if you have your Bibles, we're going to base our, our time today on 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's Word? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to read verse 17 as a backdrop. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has believed in Christ, if anyone has faith in Christ, if anyone has trusted in Jesus Christ, this one who raised from the dead, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. Lord, I pray that you'd speak to us in this moment. You know each and every heart that's here today. Still us. May we hear from you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I want to give you a few different things this morning that are real that we see here, this idea of new beginnings. When you believe in, you understand and you believe in the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you have a new beginning in a few different places. You have a new beginning in your relationship with God. You see, all the way back at the beginning, Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have sin in our lives. Sin is just a fancy word for doing what we want to do. God has said to do this, but I want to do that. God has said that I should live in this manner, but I want to live in this manner. God has said to do this this way, but I want to do this this way. 
whenever we insert our preferences over God's instruction, that's sin. That's really what sin is. And scripture says all of us have sinned. We've all fallen short of God's standard. That's, that's an important phrase there because the reality is we often want to compare ourselves to one another. And so we have all sinned in some way. Some of us have sinned a little. Some of us have sinned a lot. But all of us fall short of God's standard, which is perfection. None of us can meet his standard. So as a result, what happens? Romans 6.23 says that the wages or the payment of our sin is separation. That idea of being separated from God, it's death. Death in Scripture never means ceasing to exist. Death in Scripture means separation. So some of us here today, we have loved ones. I myself have a brother. Many of you have loved ones who are with the Lord. They have died. That death does not mean they cease to exist. That death means their soul has been separated from their body. Their soul is with the Lord, but it's not with their body anymore. That's a physical death. There is a spiritual death. So we are spiritually separated from God. But if we physically die with our soul still spiritually separated from God, our soul stays separated from God for all of eternity. But Romans 5, 8 tells us that he demonstrates, that God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were sinners, while we're separated from God, Christ came and died for us. That's the beauty of today. We recognize that Christ died for us. He was buried, but he didn't stay dead. He rose from the dead. And it says in Romans 10, 9, that if you confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart in who Jesus is and who he claimed to be, remember, he's not here for he is risen, as he said. Jesus always claimed to be the Messiah, always claimed to be the eternal Son of God, always claimed to be these things. If you believe in him, Scripture says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart in Jesus, what will happen? You will be saved. That word saved means to be rescued. Saved out of lostness. Rescued. Bought out of the marketplace of sin. Redeemed. That's what happens when you believe in Christ as your Savior. The resurrection of Jesus Christ, that empty tomb, brings about such a strong reality that you and I now can have a new beginning in a relationship with God the Father you and I have a new beginning with him. We no longer are tied to this old sinful self. In fact, God sees you now as a justified. He sees you in who he saved you to be. That's how God views you. So you can leave the old person behind. You no longer have to be that man or that woman. You no longer have to do that because God sees you the way he has saved you to be. So you have a new relationship with God the Father. It's a new beginning. Not only do you have a new beginning with God, but you have a new beginning in life. So many times we say, well, I got my eternity secured. I'm so glad for that. And then we go on living our own life. That's not what God saved us to do. He saved us to have a right relationship with God. And then he wants to change our life. Give us a new life. That's why the name of our church is New Life. You're no longer tied to your old self. You have a a new way of living. And in fact, the resurrection of Jesus Christ provides proof that the Bible is true. If you go to make a big purchase, I assume that you have to provide proof of insurance. Maybe you have to have proof of funds. Maybe you have to have proof that you can care for or take care of the thing that you're purchasing. What are those things? Do? Those proofs that you are giving to the institution that you're purchasing from, what you're doing is you're proving that you can handle the purchase. When Jesus rose from the dead, he was proving that he could handle the purchase for your life in Jesus Christ. He was proving that. So that means that when you go to the word of God now, you can say all of this is true because when Jesus rose from the dead, he provided proof that everything in this book is real and it's, it's worth following. So when you believe in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have a new beginning and you know what happens? You start to live a little differently because God's word like comes to life now. You're like, man, I actually want to know what the Bible says about this. I want to know what the Bible says about this subject in my life. I want to know what the Bible says about this thing in my life. And so you know what happens? There's a new beginning. If you're married, your husband or your wife, they get a new spouse. That's what happened. You, not a new spouse, like, okay. You become the new spouse, okay? <laughs> so you're like, I'm not, I'm not believing in Jesus then. I want to stay married. No. Your husband and wife, they get a new spouse. They get a new husband and wife because you change. You're 
children. They get a new father and a new mother or a new mother because you change. You become sensitive to God's word, so you start doing things from Scripture, and it, it changes you. Some of us in this room, some of you athletes, some of you teenagers, your, your coaches get different athletes. Some of you in this room, you're, you're employed, your employers, your coworkers, they get new employees, they get new coworkers because you show up and your life is being changed from the inside out. It doesn't happen all at once, it happens over time. But there's a new beginning in your life. You have a new way of living and it comes from God's word and it's a new way of going about everything in life. Children, as you get saved, you, your, your parents get a new child. I told the early service, I feel like I should clarify in the second service too, that doesn't mean that your parents are going to have another child, okay? I'm going to believe in Jesus so we can, I can get a brother or sister, okay? You become the new child. You become the new life. So we have a new relationship with God. We have a new life. We also have a new purpose. I don't know if you know this, but the American society, we are one of the most well-off societies that we've ever had in existence in our country. And we are one of the most depressed we've ever had in existence. We're even more depressed now than people were during the Great Depression. And that was pretty depressing. Would you agree? We don't want to go back to that. Some of us see signs that it could happen. We don't want to go back to that. But, we're so depressed. Why are we so depressed? You, know, you want to know why we're so depressed? We're so depressed because we have bought the American lie. You know what the American lie is? The more I experience and the more I do and the more self-focused I become, the more fulfilling life is. You know what happens? That is a lie from the pit of hell. That is not your purpose on this earth. Your purpose on this earth isn't to see as many sights as you can, do as many things as you can, and uh, experience as many opportunities as you can, although those are wonderful things. They're not your purpose. Your purpose is to glorify God. And when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, what happens is you have a brand new purpose for living. It's no longer for self. Remember, self is what got us in trouble. Selfishness makes us sin. God says do this, I want to do that. That's what self-living does. So the more self we feed ourselves, more selfishness, all that happens is, is we sin more and it takes us further away from our purpose in life. Our purpose is to bring glory to God in everything that we do. And we want to participate in the gospel ministry. And so what God wants to do is he wants to use us strategically in his kingdom work. I see a lot of people here today dressed in their Sunday best, their Easter best. It's wonderful. You watch all the little kids come in and they got their ties on or they got their shirts on. They're tucked in. They're looking. They're ready to go. Man, they, they, they own it today. And if you guys go to, you don't have to raise your hands, but have you been to the mall lately? Do people still go to the mall? I don't know. But when you go to the mall, what happens? You walk down the mall corridor and you're walking through and there's all these stores. And what do stores have? Stores don't have sales if you don't come in the stores. So what do stores do? They put mannequins out and they put these mannequins and they put them all on the storefront and they dress them to a T in their store's uh, attire. And so the idea is, is as you walk by these stores, you're like, oh, that looks interesting. Man, I'll bet I'd look good in that. And so you walk in and you might take a look at it. You might try it on. I had an uncle, he told, I said, man, that looks good. He goes, hey, I, whatever's on the mannequin, I buy it. That's how I work, okay? I walk in, if it's on the mannequin, I want each one of those pieces, put it on me. That's how it works. Great, that's wonderful, that's one way to buy it. Listen, that's what the mannequin is designed to do. It's designed to draw you into the store. And when it draws you into the store, you know what happens? You're more apt to spend money. And that's why they're there. They want you to spend your money. Now, you and I, on our best days, we're just dressed up dummies. That's the truth. That's the truth. Oftentimes, we want to put so much importance in ourselves, but we're not the important part. The important part is what God clothes us in. You see, when we put on the clothes of righteousness, when we put on right living, righteousness is just a fancy word for doing the right thing. That's just what it is. So we put on the clothes of righteousness. In fact, it says all scripture is given by inspiration, right? It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and instruction in righteousness. All of the Bible gives us how to be clothed in God's clothing. And the idea is what we want to do, our purpose becomes to use the clothing of God as dressed up dummies to draw people in to a relationship with God. 
When people walk by us, they should say, not what is so special about you, but what is in you? Man, what's in your life? What is so different in your life? Why are things different in you and not in me? It's not about drawing attention to ourselves. Our goal is to draw people in to see God. It brings a greater purpose. The Apostle Paul, who we all love him, he's quoted as saying in Philippians chapter 4, he says, I lay, I lay hold of that which the Lord has laid hold of me. He says that right before he says, I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Each and every person in this room, we have, God has laid hold of us for a specific purpose. A specific thing but ultimately it's an upward call and it's to bring glory and honor to him through our drawing of others to Jesus Christ that's what God wants to do with our life so it takes even the mundane things in our life and it brings significance to them it takes even just the trivial things that we do on a daily basis and it brings significance and meaning to them but you cannot have meaning and you cannot have fulfillment the way you were created by the Creator if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your resurrected Savior. So we have a great relationship with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ. We have a new life to live, a new beginning in our life through faith in Jesus Christ. We have a fresh purpose in our life because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know what else we have? We have a new power. You know, we've been going through life. The reality is, if we don't know Jesus Christ as our Savior, or a lot of believers even are guilty of this, we try to go about life on our own. We do things in our own power, our own intellect, our own will, our own wit. We do all these things in this way, and you know what? It only takes us so far. Man, we read these accounts in the Old Testament. See, the Old Testament is now behind, and the New Testament is where we are with God. So we have a new relationship with God. We've talked about that. That new power comes through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Now, in the Old Testament times, we read these accounts. In the Old Testament times, we think about people like Noah. Noah, man, think about what God did through the power of the Holy Spirit. God gave Noah the ability to build the ark, and he went with Noah through the rough waters and through all of that stuff, and God preserved Noah and his family. That same Holy Spirit resides in your life. That's what makes the New Testament and the Old Testament different. The Holy Spirit in the Old Testament would come upon people and leave. Come upon people and leave. He resided when they built the temple in the Holy of Holies. You and I now are the temple of Jesus Christ. So here's the deal. As the temple of God, the Holy Spirit resides in us. So the Holy Spirit that came upon people and strengthened them for a time, we read their accounts, we're like, man, that's incredible. Man, Joseph, the same Holy Spirit that gave Joseph the ability to go through uh, slavery and imprisonment and then ultimately to rule over Egypt. That same Holy Spirit resides in your life. The same Holy Spirit who gave David the ability to defeat Goliath, he resides in your life. The same Holy Spirit who was in Daniel, who gave him the courage to face the lions, and he resides in your life. That's what God has done. He has put the Holy Spirit in you. That makes us as New Testament believers different than Old Testament believers. And that came when Jesus rose from the dead, started a new covenant with us. That's the reality. We have the new power. We have this reality. Now, you and I, we're not like DC Comics. We're not going to go out there and we're not Captain America and those types of things. But here's the deal. Whatever you're going through in your life, the Holy Spirit will empower you to walk through it. Some of us are going through hard times. Some of us are going through good times. Some of us are going through horrific times. Some of us are going through challenges. Some of us are just navigating uncertainty. Guess what? The Holy Spirit empowers you to face whatever life brings your way. That's all because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, it's not just that. We don't just have a great relationship with God now. We don't just have a new life to live. We don't just have a new purpose and a new power. You know what else we have? Because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we have a new eternity awaiting us. I don't know if you know this, but in the Old Testament times, death was very vague. They knew there was some kind of connotation, like somehow we want to dwell with God. They didn't know about it. They didn't understand it. 
It was very un- misunderstood. In fact, you read about the place of Sheol, the place of death in the Psalms. You, you read about the, but it was very vague. You know what the resurrection of Jesus Christ does? Clarifies everything. Jesus said in John 14, he says in verse 1, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself so that where I am, you can be also, Jesus says. Then Thomas says, well, Lord, we don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? Why? Because Thomas was basing his knowledge off of the Old Testament. He didn't totally understand. Lord, death is uncertain. We don't totally get it. Where are you going? And how do we get there? Jesus says, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus has ascended to the Father. His resurrected body that rose from the dead ascended into the sky, went to heaven. He sits at the right hand of God the Father, and he is preparing a place for you and for me. And so what that means is that we have a new eternity awaiting us. And we get a picture of that in Revelation chapter 20 and 21. Revelation chapter 20 is pretty scary. It talks about the great white throne judgment, how the sea of dead is, is released. And it's like those who died out at sea, man, they're all called up before the Lord. Those who died in different ways, they are all called up before the Lord. And the Lord, it says in, in Revelation chapter 20, he judges the living and the dead. He judges them all. Every soul will give an account to God. So we see that in Revelation chapter 20. But then there's the beauty of Revelation 21. Revelation 21 says that there's this new heaven and new earth. And I saw Jerusalem descending out of the sky and streets of gold. There's this reality of no more pain and no more suffering and no more sickness, and no more death, and no more of those things, no more tears. Everything that makes you cry will be gone. Scripture says he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. That's the reality of our future. Some of us here today, we have loved ones who are with the Lord. Here's the beauty of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He rose from the dead. He had breakfast by the sea. They touched his hands and his feet. They touched the scars. They embraced him. They hugged him. You know what that means? That means that no matter what has happened to your loved one, if they are with the Lord, you and I one day will rise they will rise. We will embrace them again. We will be together with them again. That is the reality of eternity, and that is given to us because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why we're all here this morning. So I've got to ask you, when you hear about things of eternity, what comes to your mind? We live in a time, it's the information age. You can find anything you want now. It can be both a a gift and it can also be a curse. You can find all kinds of things online where people are trying to explain away eternity. You can. It's like people are like, there's no way there's a forever. There's no way. We got to find a way to explain it away. How can we do this? And you can find ways that people trying to explain it away. But you know what is so great? You can never explain away God because here's the deal. It says in Jeremiah, it says that he wrote eternity on our hearts. He wrote eternity on our hearts. That's why if people are rejecting God, don't call it unbelief, it's rejection. They want to reject God, and if they can reject God, they want to try to explain away God. And if they can explain away God, then they feel better about rejecting God. And here's the deal. No matter how much you try to reject and try to explain and try to reason and try to trade the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for time, chance, and reason, you know what? No matter how much you try to explain that away, in the quietness of your own heart, when you go to bed at night, you know you're eternal. God wrote it on your heart. There's no mistaking it. You will go on forever. It's just a question of where. Will you be with the Lord or away from the Lord? I don't know about you, I love amusement parks. Our family loves amusement parks. When we go to amusement parks, whether it's a water park or rides, we love spending time together as a family. It's awesome. Oftentimes when we go, you know, if, you like to, if you're an, an, a Hoosier, you got to go to Holiday World at some point in time. It's, it's worth the five, six-hour drive. It's a great place. I grew up going there. But the dad in me now sees things differently. 
the dad in me does. You pay a ticket price, and you go in. And you're like, okay, we got to manage the day. we got to plan our attack. Oftentimes, we have the map before we go into the park. Anybody do this? If we go here, 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 and here, then we'll be in line for here, 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 and here, and then we'll get to here, 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 and here. And if we're lucky, we're going to make it to 10 rides. And we're like, yes. If we're real lucky, we'll make it to 12. No promises, kids. Like, okay, all right, 12 rides. 12 rides over the course of a day. You take that, you take a look at the ticket price. 12 rides. For your t- that average is out to be, depending on what you spend on your tickets, roughly 7 to $10 per person per ride. Just so you know. Any, in case you're a dad out there thinking about this. No other dads, I'm sure, do this. And then the average ride is 90 seconds. 90. So you're thinking about this. You're like, okay, so da, 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 if we make the 12 rides, 18 minutes of thrills. 18 minutes. That's what you got in your 12 hours in that amusement park. It sounds like a lot of amuse- amusing going on, right? But the really good parks, you know what they do? The really good parks? They turn the line into an experience. It's experiential. You walk in, and you're like, oh, man, it's like we're here. It's like we're... Everything around the line has to do with the ride. You're like, oh, this is cool. And you're seeing like testimonials of people and you're watching people go on the ride and you're seeing them go through and you're like, that's cool. You got characters popping up and they're like talking to you and there's all this stuff and you're like, oh, this is cool. And then there's a drink cart and you're like, oh, I think I'm gonna get a Pepsi and you're like grabbing drinks and you're, there's food before you go in and you're eating your food along the journey and you don't even realize, I mean, if you have little kids, you do realize, but if you, you kind of don't even realize that you've been in line for an hour and 20 minutes before you get on the ride. And you get off after 90 seconds like, woo, ah, where are we going next, guys? That was awesome, you know? The parks have us duped. They have us all duped. They know how to get us. They distract us all the way. They entertain us all the way. And you don't even realize you're paying seven to ten dollars per person, per ride, for 18 minutes. 18 minutes. The truth is, that's what Satan has done to us. He's turned life into one gigantic, experiential, environmental ride. He's got us so busy. He's got us so entertained. He's got us so focused on ourselves. He's got us so focused on everything that we're missing that there is an eternity coming. Satan has us duped all the way up until we arrive at the gates of hell. That's his goal. Steal, kill, destroy. Trick, lie, deceit. That's what he does. That's his game. That's the game he plays. He's out for keeps, and he wants your soul. And if he can't have your soul, he wants your life. That's his goal. And if he can't have your life, he wants the lives of people around you. That's why God needs strong men in homes, because Satan's coming after your home. He's coming after your children. He's coming after your spouses. That's what he wants. He wants to steal, kill, and to destroy. And he's got us all entertained in the process. And we don't even notice where we're at. Jesus rose from the dead, conquering sin, death, and hell itself because he wanted to create an opportunity for a new relationship with God the Father. He wants to give you a new life, a new starting point, a new beginning to do things God's way, not your own way. He wants to give you a new purpose to draw others to him. No matter what you're doing, no matter what your career is, no matter what your family situation is, he wants to use you to draw people to him. He wants to use you. He wants to empower you for your purpose through the Holy Spirit. And he wants to give you a new eternity. Because you and I at one time were headed towards a place called hell, but through Jesus Christ and faith in him, he can redirect you to a real place called heaven. That's the truth of the gospel. Would you go to the Lord in prayer with me this morning? With every head bowed and every eye closed, 
We're going to be done in just a few minutes, and you're going to go pick up your children, but I don't want to miss this moment. You're here today. Some of you came because you wanted to. Some of you came because you had to. Some of you came because you were invited to. Some, be, some came because, you, you know, your, your mom or dad wanted you to come or your brother or sister, but here's the deal. All of us are here for a reason. God knows you're here, and he wanted you here, and he wanted you to hear this message. And if you're here this morning and you know you need a new beginning in your relationship with God, you need a new beginning in life, in your purpose, if you need a new beginning in your eternity, I want to encourage you in the quietness of your own heart, go before him today. Don't leave here confused. Go in peace with God and say, Jesus, I believe in you, that you are God's eternal son who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Please come into my life and save me. Again, that's Jesus. I believe in you, that you are God's eternal son who died on the cross and rose from the dead for my sins. Forgive me. Come into my life and save me. I wonder if you're here this morning, no one's looking around, and you affirmed what you believe about Jesus today. Would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Michael, I affirmed what I believe about Jesus today. I see that hand. Thank you. I see those hands. Thank you. I see that hand. Yes. I see that hand. Yes, I see that hand. Thank you. Off to my right, your left. Anybody over here? Thank you. <laughs> Believing, friend, it's just you and God right now. Have you been knocked off of your purpose? Do you feel like you've been knocked off of your power? Do you feel like you've lost focus on your, your new life that you really have? Do you need to start over with the Lord? Tell him, Lord, I, I've gotten off with you and I want to start fresh with you first John 1 9 says if we confess with our our mouth he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins to cleanse us from all unrighteousness so just talk to the Lord say Lord I I've gotten away from you in this area or I've gotten off in this area I want to start fresh with you would you just give me a blank slate Lord I'm sorry for the, this way that I've been living I'm ready to start fresh Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ. We thank you that he came, lived a sinless life, died a sacrificial death, and rose triumphantly from the dead. We thank you for the new beginnings that it offers to each and every person who believes in him. Lord, we ask that in this moment, Lord, you would encourage those who know you as their Savior, Lord, build the faith of those who trust you today as their Lord. Lord, we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we close in song? How great the chasm that lay between us how high the mountain i could not climb in desperation i turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night then through the darkness your loving
began to breathe out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim glad to be in church on Easter. Would you say amen? amen? Amen. Now here's what I want to encourage you to do. If you responded to faith in Christ today, make sure you let somebody know. Send us an email. Send us a note. We want to celebrate with you. If you are visiting this area, we would encourage you. Make sure you find a Bible teaching church when you go back home. If you're in the area, we want you to know you're always welcome here. We'd love to help you be grounded in the Word of God so you can live that new life for Jesus Christ. We're so glad you're worshiping with us this Easter. We hope you have a great afternoon. Would you pray the benediction with me this morning? Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded toward one another according to Christ Jesus, that you may with one mind and one mouth glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You are dismissed.